Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Books and Books and the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University, welcome to this virtual book presentation of the book, Dancing with a Revolution, Power, Politics, and Privilege in Cuba by Elizabeth Schwab and published by the University of North Carolina Press. My name is Jorge Duani. I'm the director of the Cuban Research Institute. And as usual, we're happy to co-sponsor tonight's event, bringing the best work in uh, Cuban and Cuban American studies to Miami and also to our virtual audience. We look forward to holding in-person events uh, at Books and Books in Coral Gables next January. Before we proceed, let me remind you that you can submit your questions for the author during and after her talk through the Ask a Question uh, box at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the, her talk, I'll compile as many questions as possible and post them to her so that she can address them. I'm extremely pleased to introduce our guest author tonight, Dr. Elizabeth Schwa, who is an, an assistant professor of history at Northern Arizona University. Before uh, joining Northern Arizona, she held visiting and research position, positions at several universities, including as a visiting lecturer in history at the University of California, Berkeley, a research fellow at the Center for Ballet and the Arts at New York University, Mellon Guest Lecturer of Dance Studies at Stanford University, and Mellon Dance Studies in and the Humanities Postdoctoral Fellowship at Northwestern University. She earned her PhD in history, as well as master's degrees from Columbia University, and her bachelor's degree magna cum laude in history from Princeton University. She specializes in 20th century Latin America and the Caribbean, including Cuba and Brazil. Her research focuses on the intersection of history and dance studies, and her teaching interests include the histories of race, gender, and sexuality, popular culture, and migration in Latin America and the Caribbean. She has published articles and reviews in professional journals, such as Hispanic American Historical Review, Dance Chronicle, Cuban Studies, Studies in Musical Theater, Gender and History, and New West Indian Guide. She's also the author of two book chapters. She has received numerous academic recognitions and prizes for her work, such as, such as James Alexander Memorial Prize, the George Doris and Jack Anderson Prize, the Doris K. Quinn Foundation Dissertation Fellowship, and the Goizueta Foundation Graduate Fellowship at the Cuban Heritage Collection of the University of Miami Libraries. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Elizabeth Schwab. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Jorge, um, for that very generous introduction and um, for the invitation. I also want to thank FIU, um, FIU's Cuban Research Institute, Books and Books, and the Miami Book Fair for um, having me. And I'm just so thrilled by the opportunity to share my work with your community. Um, I also want to sincerely thank every single one um, of you who logged on to a late afternoon or evening talk on a Tuesday, depending on where you are. Um, it has been a strange thing to uh, publish a book during a pandemic. And any opportunity I have to connect and share a little bit about my work um, and in an opportunity like this one means a great deal. So I really appreciate your time. So for my presentation today, I wanna to tell you a little bit about my book and I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, are you all seeing my screen okay? Jorge? Yes, we are. Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, so uh, I uh, thank you again for this beautiful poster as well. I had to feature it in my PowerPoint because I'm um, so taken by it. So um, I want to share a little bit about my book, Dancing with the Revolution, Power, Politics, and Privilege in Cuba. It has seven chapters and it examines the history of professional dancers rather than say dancers in a ritual or festive setting. Um, and I'm looking at how these professional dancers navigated their relationship with several Cuban governments from 1930 to 1990. I look at how dancers honed their artistic priorities and their tactics for securing resources from the government in the decades before the 1959 Cuban Revolution. And then I look at how after 1959, dancers used their pre-revolutionary pre experiences to take advantage of new opportunities coming out of the regime change to ultimately promote 
what what ended up being long-standing dance causes. So they definitely existed before 1959, and then they take on kind of this new life um, after 1959. Uh, these dancers were able to succeed with flying colors. And what I mean by that is Cuba has a world-renowned dance establishment. So in some ways, this book explains a success story. By the same token, this book is equally about pain, struggle, failure, and frustration. Haggling with governments for money and towing political lines can were not always easy or pleasant endeavors. So choreographers had to deal with things like censorship and self-censorship. Um, as uh, for those of you who don't know, the revolutionary government uh, ended up controlling the press and suspending elections after 1959. Artists also had to keep political mandates in mind. Uh, there were other uh, repressive forces at play. Black dancers had to deal with racial and class prejudices, both within the cultural bureaucracy and among uh, the general audience. Um, there were also, uh, there was a great deal of homophobia, again, within the government, but also the general audience. Homosexual dancers faced police uh, harassment and professional roadblocks due to their sexual orientation. And there weren't just tensions between uh, dancers on one hand and representatives of the state on the other. There were also tensions within the dance world. So modern and folkloric dancers, uh, and I'll talk more about those terms shortly, uh, felt like ballet dancers pushed their agenda and unfairly secured the majority of limited resources. And that's just one example. Along with these inter-company tensions, there were also um, intra company tensions, so tensions within a single company. So for instance, in the ballet company, a younger generation of dancers resented an older generation that refused to seed the stage. So as a famous example, um, Cuban ballerina and ballet director Alicia Alonso danced into her 70s. And there are many other examples of these kind of tensions and frustrations uh, that I talk about um, at different levels and between different um, people in my book. So this book is about how uh, dancing Cuban citizens worked hard to secure the present and future of their art, experiencing both exciting successes and fierce disappointments in the process. So I wanna take the next half hour or so to share the main arguments and goals of the book, as well as a little bit about how and where I conducted my research. Then I wanna leave plenty of time for questions as I find that the most interesting part of any presentation. So to start, I want to take us back to my first encounter with Cuban dance as an undergraduate. Uh, I was assigned in a history seminar, the 1961 speech given by Cuban leader Fidel Castro. In this speech, uh, which was known as the words to the intellectuals uh, speech, he mentioned the ballet and modern dance companies and their recent successes abroad on tour. I was completely floored by this mention. I had danced all my life and I simply couldn't imagine a US leader mentioning dancers in a major speech, much less even knowing about them. I wondered how and why did staged dance become so important in Cuba, important enough to receive attention in a consequential address? What role did dancers play in revolutionary Cuban society, culture and politics. I also wondered what was the relationship like between dancers and the state and how did it change over time? I wrote some papers exploring these questions as an undergraduate um, and then I expanded this inquiry as it became my doctoral dissertation, which also became the foundation of my book. In my book, I examined the trajectories of uh, three staged dance forms, uh, ballet, modern dance and folkloric dance. And for those unfamiliar, ballet originated in European courts and has retained associations with whiteness and elite culture in Cuba and elsewhere. Modern dance uh, emerged in the 20th century in the United States and Europe, but Cuban innovators nationalized the form by integrating Afro-Cuban dance into these borrowed foreign techniques. And then fo folkloric dance staged ritual and popular dances from Cuba, especially those springing from Afro-Cuban culture. So even though these dancers uh, similarly performed in theaters, depended on state budgets, had extensive training, and took international tours, they had very different demographics and aesthetics. Ballet tended to be whiter and to project whiteness. Modern dance was more diverse and staged Afro-Cuban themes, 
Folkloric dance had a majority of African descended dancers and stage dances associated with la calle or the street. And as a result of all of these um, factors, not all dancers and dance forms were treated equally in revolutionary Cuba. And I'll say more about that shortly. So now that you know what the book is fundamentally about in terms of time period and topic, I wanna move to this image. I stumbled across it in a modern dance archive in Havana on a hot June day in 2017. And it helps to illuminate the main argument of the book encapsulated in the phrase dancing with the revolution. Uh, and this is the front part of the title. And this is the image that is on the front cover. So you might be wondering what exactly I mean by this phrase. And I think uh, it's, it's important because it does, as I said, illuminate this main argument that I'm making. And basically it's tempting to assume that dancers like other artists and citizens had little choice, but to adhere closely to state dictates, dictates given the realities of censorship and official control over expression in revolutionary Cuba that I mentioned earlier. However, I found that dancers did not march in lockstep behind the revolution, um, but rather navigated their partnership with state-led political projects like one would a dancing partner. So if you can envision dancers, um, they improvise, they both shape the trajectory of the, the performance. So like this metaphoric dance, um, dancers and uh, the government are both interacting and shaping revolutionary dance projects sometimes in sync and at others out of sync. So to understand how this image in particular um, illuminates the idea of dancing with the revolution, I need to provide a little bit of background on this image in particular. So these are modern dancers and they were posing for a photo shoot. Uh, the photographs from the shoot like this one were then used to make political posters. Um, and these posters weren't necessarily representing dancers specifically, but rather Cuban citizens writ, writ large. So in this way, dancers became emblems of revolutionary militancy. At first glance, it would seem that they and other dancers perhaps allied with the revolution without any issue. However, things were far more complicated. In the early 1970s, just um, probably about two years before these photographs were taken, there was actually a lot of tension between modern dancers and the government. Censorship had caused a company crisis, uh, yet dancers managed their way out of this crisis and continued despite considerable odds. So even though their aggressive stances reflected the genuine militancy of some of these dancers um, and responded to the expectation that all Cubans perform support for the revolution, as was called for in this photo shoot, uh, the poses also encapsulated something different. Um, and this was their determination to protect and promote their art, sometimes with the government's help and at other times in spite of government forces getting in their way. Dancing with the revolution then was about political partnerships with the government and the innovative moves dancers took to navigate the relationship and promote their dance causes. So in addition to this main argument encapsulated in the first part of the title, I also contribute insights into power, politics, and privilege in Cuba. Looking at the first of these, in Dancing with the Revolution, performers found opportunities to exert power. To understand this power, let's consider this photograph of Alicia Alonso, uh, the ballerina I've already mentioned, who is in the center, in the midst of chatting with Fidel Castro. Alonso was a famed ballerina who was in many cases able to get her way, often to the dismay of bureaucrats. So for instance, in a series of memos I found in the archive, uh, bureaucrats talk about trying to convince Alonso to make some casting changes because they feared a particular dancer might defect while performing abroad. They knew they could not necessarily convince Alonzo to change the casting um, or that they wouldn't have the final say on the matter. So in these, this back and forth, the Minister of Culture at the time instructed a lower level uh, bureaucrat to just keep an eye on the dancer um, it, while abroad, if this dancer in question was in fact allowed to go abroad. So these behind the scenes encounters and memos that I found in one of the main archives I uh, consulted in Havana really hammered home the fact that dancers often led and government officials followed in their metaphoric and literal dance over the decades. <laughs> 
as professional performers danced with the revolution, um, they also used their bodies uh, to convey politics. This is the second main point that the book makes. I look at dancing Cubans to consider the role that physical communication plays in revolutionary politics. I discuss instances where dancers and choreographers used their ephemeral nonverbal art to make political statements that were frankly impossible to make in other media, such as the newspaper or in film, more um, concrete media. So for instance, I discuss the ballet Canto Vital from 1973 pictured here which celebrated homosocial relationships and arguably offered homoerotic images despite official homophobia. I also analyze celebrations of Black identity in works like uh, the modern dance Medea y los Negreros from 1968 pictured or the folkloric dance Palenque from 1976. And it's important to note that in this late 60s and uh, early 1970s period, um, there, there wasn't official discussion about um, racial identity and such discussions were in fact um, silenced uh, by the government. So in many ways, these could be seen as um, uh, pushing the envelope a little bit. Along with edgy content related to sex and race, uh, a couple of productions actually challenge the political status quo, such as Marianela Boan's Sin Permiso from 1988, which dealt with the permission required, uh, granted or rejected uh, to, con to create art in revolutionary Cuba. With all of these choreographic works in mind, I suggest that Cubans use their bodies rather than their words in many cases to make powerful political statements about race, gender, and revolution in this limited revolutionary public sphere. Dancers also conveyed politics by participating in state-led educational projects. Uh, take these images, for instance, of dancers performing for soldiers and agricultural workers. They contributed to a larger educational project, which included a 1961 literacy campaign, efforts to expand access to public education across the island, and cultural initiatives to make Cuba an island of artists and art connoisseurs. Dancers willingly uh, partnered with the government on this project. They performed in stadiums, factories, schools, and in the countryside for free to try to spread the gospel of dance. The hope was that Cubans of every walk of life would come to love watching dance on stage and would avidly attend the theater on their own. So these, these soldiers and farmers in the audience um, would ideally be impressed by perhaps their first encounter with these uh, ballet dancers and seek out their productions in theaters um, that which offered free or low ticket prices. Dancers' willing participation in these mass education projects makes good sense. After all, who wants to perform for an empty house? And which is why I'm very grateful for each one of you who happen to be here right now. So the idea was that everyone benefited. Dancers won their audience members and audience members would supposedly learn about art and beauty um, and be entertained in the process, therefore getting this artistic education through dance encounters. So as I discuss in one of my chapters, such campaigns had really mixed results. The effort to make staged dance a popular entertainment did indeed bring the art to many people who had previously limited access due to high ticket prices. I found letters like this one, written in careful cursive by a fisherman who clearly watched ballet performances regularly. And it's very possible that um, this gentleman not only watched them in, in the theater, but also increasingly on TV, as this became very common starting in the late 60s, especially um, ramping up in the 70s and continues to this day. Uh, in it, he praised the beauty of Alicia Alonso's art. Uh, however, not everyone loved what they saw. Not everyone was uh, really into ballet, for instance, like this particular uh, author. So for instance, delegates attending a high profile women's Congress in Havana in the early 80s were taken to a ballet performance as part of the official events um, and they quickly fell asleep in the theater. So that's that the, the fact that these people are forced to attend these um, uh, stage dance performances and find other ways to kind of wiggle out of the, the requirement, such as falling asleep, um, really indicates the kind of ambivalence of some of these mass education projects, including the dance appreciation component of it. So along with dancing politics, I also examine privilege in the dance world. 
First, I show how professional dancers in general had unique privileges within Cuban society. For instance, they traveled internationally, whereas the typical Cuban citizen in, revolution, in revolutionary times rarely, if ever, left the country. They not only performed for foreign audiences, but also spent sometimes months and even years uh, advising schools and companies abroad. So for instance, in this uh, photograph, you see Cuban modern dancer Gerardo Lestra pointing something out to his students at the National School of Dance of Guiana, which he directed for a year. I call this form of foreign advising dance internationalism in my book. And with this phrase, I'm really borrowing from a more often studied medical internationalism, which has involved the Cuban government deploying doctors to places around the world needing medical aid. Perhaps some of you listening right now have heard of this term, medical internationalism. And it continues to this day. For instance, most recently uh, in, in the spring of 2020, Cuban doctors, the government sent Cuban doctors to Italy as it battled with COVID-19. In any case, I see something similar going on in terms of the dance expertise of Cuban dancers as they were um, exported in some ways uh, to countries all over the world, uh, Europe, Africa, uh, Latin America, um, really, really everywhere. These opportunities abroad gave dancers access to hard currency in terms of honorariums and uh, per diems and, and whatnot, and also status as cosmopolitan artists. Along with the privileges enjoyed arguably by all dancers as respected artists, and I think this is a tension that, that they often struggle with and I talk about in one of my chapters, I also examine differential levels of privilege within the dance world where ballet really reigned supreme. Um, I saw this painting uh, by Cuban artist Alexis Esquivel when he gave a talk at UC Berkeley in 2018, and I was thrilled because I felt it so brilliantly encapsulated this idea that I had, or this this conclusion I had drawn about this, um, uh, the fact that ballet enjoyed this privileged position, and um, in this image. Vilma Espin, a revolutionary fighter, politician, and wife of Raul Castro, appears uh, wearing military fatigues on top and ballet gear on the bottom. I asked Esquivel after his presentation about the painting, and he smiled, noting that it playfully illuminates the close relationship that he noticed between revolutionary notables like Espin, who danced as a child uh, before the revolution, and the art of ballet. Although revolutionary Cuba proclaimed to eradicate racial and class prejudice, we see these social hierarchies remaining in place as the government privileged a form that represented whiteness in Cuban imaginaries. And you can see this preferential treatment in documents that I consulted, for instance, looking at salaries, budgets, etc., reveals that the majority white ballet company, um, companies uh, enjoyed the most support, financial support from the government, while the more diverse modern dance company and majority Afro-Cuban folkloric dance companies had more trouble securing equal state support. These differences also manifested in other non-monetary ways. Uh, for instance, I already showed a picture of Fidel Castro chatting with Alicia Alonso, uh, clearly in the midst or after a ballet performance that he attended, which he did often, especially with foreign dignitaries in tow. And by contrast, he only attended folkloric and modern dance performances in rare instances. And in fact, there's really only one folkloric performance and one modern dance performance that I know for certain that he was in the audience. So the special status of ballet in Cuba continues. It was confirmed in, during Obama's uh, 2016 visit, for instance, Obama met Alicia Alonso as pictured here, and he delivered his historic televised address to the Cuban people at the Gran Teatro Alicia Alonso. Alonso as pictured in, in um, uh, in the other photograph, sat a couple seats away from then President Raul Castro during the address. So here, ballet is literally seated uh, just a couple seats away from state power. And as this indicates, ballet has been and remains the most privileged dance form in Cuba. The fact that the revolutionary government threw the most support behind a dance form that celebrated whiteness and elite sensibilities is revealing, especially when compared to its 
passive aggressive antagonism um, or lukewarm support for modern and folkloric dance, uh, which drew more heavily on black aesthetics. So uh, in seven chapters that are listed here, I trace how Cubans um, danced with the revolution and their power, politics, and differential privileges. The first two chapters focuses on the pre-1959 period, the 1930s to through the 50s. And the first chapter looks at how and why ballet became a valued national art. And it indeed had established this status by the 1950s. And second, on uh, the second chapter looks at how Cubans explored race and nation through dance in the 1930s through the 50s. And um, what I draw out is the fact that many innovators uh, in this period established their artistic priorities, especially regarding race and nation, and then they will continue to be the leaders of the dance movements in, in revolutionary Cuba. So tracing these continuities across 1959. The rest of the book traces how dancers innovated after the 1959 Cuban Revolution. Chapter three examines the racial and class prejudice that guided revolutionary dance institutionalization in the 1960s, as well as how African descended dancers challenged these structural inequalities. Chapter four analyzes how dancers, choreographers, and company directors across the genres, so regardless of whether it was the more privileged ballet or the more uh, beleaguered modern or folkloric dance, dancers and uh, creators in all the genres had to grapple and navigate with uh, homophobia. And in fact, some even choreographed critiques of gender and sexual norms in the late 1960s and early 1970s in a period of particular repression of um, gender and sexual nonconforming Cubans. Chapter five investigates how the dance establishment made dancing and watching dance part of mass education campaigns in the 1960s and 70s. And chapter six looks at how staged dance became a lucrative export and part of international politics of the 70s and 80s. And finally, chapter seven uh, analyzes ruptures in Cuba as the first revolutionary generation came of age and as post-1959 dance institutions began to show their age. Although the epilogue reiterates major conclusions in how these historic developments inform the present, the core analysis focuses on 1930 to 1990. The narrative ends before the onset of major changes to Cuban society and culture as a result of the political and economic crisis after the fall of the Soviet Union, which had become Cuba's most important trading partner. And the, this, this crisis begins in the 1990s and goes into the 2000s. According to the dancers who are the protagonists of my study, the decades before the crisis uh, amounted to a bygone golden age of Cuban dance. Their stories then provide historical insights into the shimmering achievements, the devastating disappointments in this kind of mundane muddling through of a particular moment and era, and can hopefully help explain some historical precedents for the post-1990 cultural productions that other scholars have already analyzed, um, particularly anthropologists in terms of after 1990. So now that you know the main arguments and content of the book, I wanna share a bit about how and where I conducted my research. A really key archive uh, that I consulted uh, was the Ministry of Culture archive in Havana, which is filled with documents like the ones pictured that include behind the scenes memos, reports, budgets, salaries, letters of complaint, photographs, performance programs, tour itineraries, and pedagogy plans. These never before analyzed documents allow me to tell a different story than the one that had been told about Cuban dance and told very well and dynamically. Nevertheless, those other um, histories tended to be based largely on information about public final products rather than this backstage politicking. It is extraordinarily difficult to do archival research on post-1959 Cuba and really on any topic, um, but specifically on uh, information on post-1959 Cuba is difficult because most of the documents of this era are not open for research. 
I gained unprecedented access to internal documents, I think, uh, because of timing and topic. In terms of timing, I did the bulk of my research from 2012 to 2017 uh, during the Obama years. And I did take a final trip uh, for this book in 2019, the summer of 2019, and I did notice a shift. This period of, of 2012 to 2017 was a period of thawing, hope, and openness, and it impacted the climate in the archives and ultimately what was possible research-wise. In terms of topic, I believe that I benefited from the fact that Cuba is proud of its stance establishment, and for good reason. I was given pretty open access to boxes on the companies that I study, and I think that archivists assumed that the contents told a story of triumph and good revolutionary faith. And I certainly found plenty of that. However, I also found uh, more troubling materials. For instance, I found lists of dancers who were labeled positive or negative, with the latter consisting mostly of people with homosexual written next to their name in parentheses, which you may or may not be able to make out. Um, it's on the second half of the page. So these lists were part of larger dossiers that were collected, um, especially when dancers were being considered for foreign tours. And these kind of dossiers made manifest the kind of surveillance, policing, and even harassment that dancers experienced. So it tells a very different story than triumph and, and good, good revolutionary faith and good relations between artists and the government. In addition to the Ministry of Culture archives, I also looked at institute materials at institutions like the Teatro Nacional de Cuba, Archivo Nacional de Cuba, the company headquarters of the Ballet de Camagüey, and the Museo Nacional de la Danza in Havana. I also conducted oral history interviews with many dancers on the island, uh, such as Alicia Alonso in 2015, the late Alicia Alonso, in 20, um, I, I spoke with her in 2015, as well as many dancers in the diaspora in Puerto Rico um, uh, and also in the United States. Uh, of particular importance in terms of dancers in the diaspora uh, to my research has been Caridad Martinez, who was part of the first generation trained after 1959 and who remains the only Afro-Cuban ballerina to reach principal status in Cuba. Uh, she has been very generous uh, with her time. She has shared over 15 hours of oral history interviews with me. Uh, she also shared the photograph that was um, uh, it was her Ballet Teatro de la Habana uh, company uh, that their photograph is on the poster for this evening. Um, in terms of archival materials outside of Cuba, the Cuban Heritage Collection in Coral Gables uh, provided invaluable letters like this one from Morna Birdsall, who was a U.S. expat who became a major leader of modern dance in Cuba. Uh, her family remained in the United States and she uh, uh, corresponded for decades with them. So these letters are uh, invaluable. Finally, I analyzed a lot of visual and audiovisual material that I accessed both on and off the island. With these materials, I was able to think about institutional histories of Cuban dance, the social history of dancers, what was their life like, what did they eat, what kind of frustrations did they have, what did they enjoy, and also the cultural history of Cuban politics, this idea that Cubans use their bodies uh, to express political ideas. And what did that mean? What did that look like? And what was the significance of those kind of expressions? I hope this book shows something about Cuban politics in general. Looking at dancing Cubans brings front and center the fact that Cubans use their bodies along with their words to make political statements, especially given the lack of a free press. I also hope it complicates our understandings about how Cuban citizens interacted with the government. Dancers could enthusiastically partner with the government while simultaneously struggling with it. And this is clear in the image and the anecdote around the image that I started with. Too often, Cuban artists and citizens in general are categorized as either mindlessly following whatever the government said or boldly defying it. However, the reality was far more complex and diverse. And I think um, there are many other scholars working now or recently um, who are saying similar things and realizing similar things. And, and I offer another case study of it. <laughs>
So I wanted to write a history of Cuba through dance, as well as a history of Cuban dance specifically. I also hope to write something that dance aficionados could enjoy and learn something about Cuba in the process. In other words, I hope that the book shows people with no interest in dance that the art can be revealing about social and cultural history. I also hope that people with no interest in Cuba can learn more about its complicated revolutionary history, especially since it can be caricatured or oversimplified. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time and attention. And I really look forward to your thoughts and questions. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing your wonderful work with our virtual audience. We're now going to take a few questions, and I see that there are a few already. Uh, so uh, let me invite everyone else to please use that uh, box at the bottom, and then we can uh, go through the, the main questions. Now, I wanted to uh, take advantage of my role as a moderator to ask you a sort of a general question, a couple of general questions. You, you mentioned that uh, you're a dancer, and uh, I would like you to expand perhaps on what role did your personal background uh, have in terms of your academic work? And I also wanted to know, how did you convert this passion for dancing into a historical research project? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm, I dance a lot less than I would like to right now. Um, so let me put that caveat out there. Uh, it's always been in my adult life, my preferred form of exercise. So let me put it that way. I've never been a professional dancer. I just admire greatly all professional dancers, which is why I've chosen the topic I did. So I think that my personal background made me uh, first of all, tuned and interested uh, to places that where dance was significant, which is why I was so drawn to Cuban history, uh, revolutionary history. I also think that um, I personally, the uh, dance has profoundly shaped my life uh, and I feel like shaped who I've become in terms of uh, what I enjoy and um, just just uh, what I'm interested in. And so I, I feel uh, I'm, uh, you know, very convinced that dance is very important. And I want to proselytize that and try to convince other people that dance is very important. So whether it's uh, showing how dance intervenes in po political discourse, um, how dancers are getting involved in society, um, kind of outside the, the smaller hallowed halls of a studio or a theater, that's kind of my um, goal. Uh, so that that's that definitely informed my uh, MO with this book and, and a lot of my academic work. And then in terms of the research process, I did take a lot of dance classes in Cuba. I was very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, it was a way for me to meet people and then that helped uh, me make connections to do oral history interviews. And I also think uh, even though I didn't write about it in my book, um, as some study scholars do very beautifully, um, I think it did help me get some sense of, of my the, the topic I was discussing in a way that I wouldn't have been able to access by solely reading the archival materials. Wonderful. Let me um, ask you a big question, which I think is actually uh, a quote from, from one of your chapters, and, and you covered it in your presentation now, but I just wanted to raise it as a whole, which is, and I'm quoting you, how and why did ballet become the most prominent and privileged form of dance in Cuba? after 1959? Yeah, I, I think that was the question that started me on down this rabbit hole. Um, and it, it's kind of a little bit of a paradox. People will, you know, say, why wasn't Roomba, for instance? It was the true form of the people. It's, you know, a popular art, um, all of these things. And uh, I think that there's this history, uh, the pre-1959 history is key here, which is why it's dancing with the revolution. But in order to understand that dance with the revolution, I had to talk about the pre-history. Um, so uh, for, um, I'm sure many um, who are listening right now already know this, but, um, and I've talked about Alicia Alonso, but just a little bit more about her. She um, made her professional career in the United States. She came in the late 30s with her husband, also a dancer, Fernando Alonso. 
And they were founding members of Ballet Theater, which is today American Ballet Theater, which is one of the premier companies of this country. So Cuban dancers were founding members of US Ballet. Um, and I think that's really important to realize. And she became basically an internationally acclaimed dancer and a national hero by 1947. She receives kind of this sash and this award from the president. So she had a lot of experience with this choreography of making alliances with the state and did it quite well, just as she did all this dancing on stage very um, beautifully. So um, there, there was material that I found of, you know, in 1952, when Batista's coup happens, so there's this leader, Fulgencio Batista, that takes power by military coup in 1952, um, a couple weeks after the coup, you can already sense in the performance programs and newspaper articles that the ballet dancers are like revving up, seeing what opportunity is here for us to partner with this new leader and secure our art and get more money. And they're asking for $300,000, but we can, we'll make do with 200000 And then when Fidel Castro takes power, they say, we need uh, 100000 but oh, Fidel gives us 200 How nice. So, you know, it's, it's, I think that it's it's the fact that there were these really talented ballet dancers, Cuban ballet dancers that brought uh, pride to Cuba. Cuba was already had this culture of ballet performance. Um, and on top of that, these same dancers were really good at pushing their agenda and getting money from governments. They had previous experience with that and they just use those tactics to, to soldier forward. And there's all this kind of um, intellectual gymnastics around how to justify how this previously bourgeois art fits so perfectly within revolutionary cultural canons. Um, and they'll say things like, oh, you know, uh, ballet is, is something for the people. It doesn't have to be just for the, the elites. And that's the revolutionary move we're doing. But there's definitely a tension there. And they, they grapple with it as they try to make their case. Wonderful. Here's my third and last question before we turn to the audience. Uh, how do you see your work as part of a new generation of US scholars, US-based scholars, who are writing on Cuba, especially with regard to the turn toward interpreting the Revolution from Within, which, as you know, is the title of a book where you have a chapter edited by Mike Bustamante and Jennifer Lamb. Yeah, I've been really, um, really profoundly influenced by scholars, historians like uh, Jennifer Lamb and Michael Bustamante, um, Lillian Guerra, who are all, um, you know, have 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 noticed that for so for decades, uh, Cuba, many have tended to think of Cuba, whether scholars or not, as kind of, you know, um, imbricated in US and Soviet kind of global struggles. And there's an effort to understand what was actually going on on the ground. What was the life like of a typical Cuban person? What was their experience within this highly politicized context? And I'm also fascinated by that and that's why I say, in addition to writing the institutional of Cuban the institutional history of Cuban dance, the cultural history of Cuban politics, I'm very invested in the social history of dancers. So thinking about what was the work like, what was um, you know the food that they ate, um, and I talk a little bit about how, um, and I, and I try to capture that. And actually, I'm I'm very indebted to the reviewers of the book, one of which really pushed me to to be on to fulfill that that curiosity about understanding what was the uh, what was 1961 like for a dancer in Cuba what was 1971 like you know so um i i'm really indebted to those scholars and those that feedback that i received that really pushed me to try to foreground the social histories of people that can get lost behind the politicking uh, at a at a kind of a more geopolitical or state level Wonderful. So let's turn to some of the questions uh, by the audience. Uh, first, we have a question by uh, my colleague here at FIU, Frank Luca, who wants to know how, if at all, did the early revolution of 1933 affect the trajectory of dance in Cuba? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that all of the kind of progressive nationalism that is part of the intellectual um, production and artists in the 40s and late 30s, 40s, and 50s in Cuba is a product of that 1933 revolution. And I, I find that dancers are right alongside a lot of 
writers, um, musicians, uh, visual artists who are all committed to some ideas about making, um, connecting uh, to their audiences and making their art socially conscious. So for instance, um, you know, in, in the late 40s and the 1950s, especially when Alicia Alonso, Fernando Alonso and Alberto Alonso, Fernando's brother, form the first professional ballet company, they are very explicit about, we want to bring ballet to the people. And, um, you know, they perform in stadiums and that sort of thing. And that just continues in the 1959 revolution time. But I find that discourse around popularizing the arts, having this social message, um, and there are examples of choreography about this social message. Also, there are choreographers like um, Ramiro Guerra, who is the modern dance innovator, who is very interested in integrating Afro-Cuban um, culture into his choreography. That also can be seen as um, part of this milieu of this kind of progressive nationalist, socially conscious um, uh, generation that came out of 1933. Uh, they don't, I don't have dancers themselves, you know, saying like 1933, I'm doing this in 1959, but I think they're just part of that generation of artists um, thinking about those, those kind of ideas. Great, here's a question from Caridad, no last name in, in the question. How does Castro ballet preference and lack of support by virtue of his presence for more African Cuban forms not speak to hypocrisy on his part? When did he pronounce the end of discrimination in Cuba? So um, I, I don't know if I got the first part, but um, so Castro claims that discrimination based on sex and race was eliminated in 1962. He makes an official speech. Um, Devin Spence Benson, uh, a fabulous historian who I, I just saw today is being featured at um, the FIU uh, Cuban Research Institute plenary um, in February, if I'm not mistaken. She wrote a great book about this anti-racist campaign from 1951, really pushed through 1961. Um, and so um, th that is the backdrop to the uh, that, that dancers are dancing in front of. So even though um, you know, in my talk, you know, one of my main arguments is this privileging a ballet at the expense of modern and folkloric dance. I don't want you all to think that there was no um, really interesting uh, productions around uh, Black identity, for instance. And in fact, I find dance one of these really valuable and rare um, outlets for people to think about Blackness, um, even though they're not framing it as such. Um, so for instance, um, there are productions that are inspired by Angela Davis in the early 20s, uh, right around the time that she comes herself, um, thinking about Black power in the late 60s, even though Eldridge Cleaver and others are kind of being expelled at the time. So I think that um, I personally see that um, choreographers are able to keep the conversation going in some way, shape or form around race, perhaps racism, even though racism is always being referred to as kind of like tied to, you know, the slave society or previous eras. But nevertheless, they're, they're kind of part of this effort to think about race, even though they don't frame it as such. Okay. Um, question from Kelly Urban, who I'm sure you know, um, about the photographs on your book cover and the photograph on the poster for the talk are both so striking, she says. Can you talk a little bit about the photograph on the poster and does it illustrate something different than the one that you use on the book cover? Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm also, I, I cite Kelly's excellent work on tuberculosis in my second chapter. But um, so the photo on the poster, I'll start with that. Carida Martinez, um, the only Afro-Cuban ballerina that to reach principal status, uh, basically got sick and tired of being discriminated against. She was never allowed to perform Giselle or Swan Lake, even though she, she described going up and up and up in her career and then just hitting the ceiling. And um, it's because, uh, and you know, she had a meeting with Alicia Alonso and Alonso said, you have a nose and hair problem. And so it was very blatant racism that stopped her from being able to, to perform these iconic classical roles. So she leaves the Ballet Nacional and forms the first 
a kind of experimental um, company in ballet called Ballet Teatro or Ballet Theater um, in the late 80s. And uh, she, uh, I talk about her and her work in the, in the seventh chapter. And that particular production meditated on authority and featured an image of the Virgin uh, of Caridad, uh, in, in, in the production. And also the performers were wearing military coats. And um, so I think that both the imagery of a Catholic icon was pretty shocking to many, and also um, they're marching around in military uniforms. And um, she actually, um, this was not the first time, but she is um, called in uh, and questioned about this performance. And um, they couldn't quite grasp what was going on, but Caridad told me that um, they actually, the chore some of the choreography was generated by thinking about Fidel Castro's gestures during his speeches. There was a finger, I guess. And so there's like movements with fingers. So, but that particular image is just one of many that um, she shared with me in her personal archive. And unfortunately it didn't make it into the book. So I was really happy that um, it, it, it found a, a, a place. Thank you. Um, Miriam Lubet wants to know if in the past and in the present, were there were Cuban dancers allowed to have exchange programs with dancers from other parts of the world? Yeah, um, yes, absolutely. Um, so there were a, a, a vibrant exchange programs um, in terms of, you have, you know, starting in the 60s and on, um, a lot of, um, there's this international ballet uh, festival that happened every other year, basically. Um, you have in in terms of folkloric dance, you had actually a modern, uh, a Mexican choreographer who was really um, instrumental in the early years. Uh, you also have um, uh, in modern dance, some Mexican dancers contributing and staying a couple years in Cuba to contribute. There are Uruguayan dancers that work with the modern dance company. So there, there's just um, performers from around the world that kind of circulate in and out starting in the 60s. And then in terms of Cubans, they also um, increasingly, especially in the 70s and 80s, begin doing um, they're invited to set choreography or to teach, to guest teach, guest perform all around the world. Um, and this is very common. And then in terms of kind of more formalized exchange, um, in the late 80s and into today, there are these international dance workshops that there's Folk Cuba, which is the folklore, uh, Conjunto Folklorico Nacional, the folkloric company hosts. Modern Dance also has one. Ballet um, has some sort of, um, type of program like that that allows foreign dancers to come and study, um, as well as other institutions. For instance, Alicia and Fernando Alonso's daughter, Laura Alonso, um, has an institution that uh, facilitates exchanges. So uh, that's the other thing. So often people are say, people might say Cuba is closed off from the world or just doesn't have, but that's not true in terms of dance. There's just these constant international dialogues going on. Okay. Question from Frida Masdeu. Um, how did the re regime explain why so many dancers defected in the 1980s? Yeah, so um, interesting. So in 19, uh, 1966, there's this huge defection of 10 dancers, 10 male dancers in Paris, and that's kind of the first major defection. But all all throughout kind of even the early 60s and onwards, there might be one or two that will stay behind or what have you. What I noticed, at least in terms of the dancers I studied, is there. it's not until really the 90s that there are these waves of dancers that will just leave regularly. It would, it, um, before that, it might be one or two might stay behind, but they weren't necessarily the highest level of dancers. Occasionally they were, and that was kind of seen as a huge political blow. But it was really in the 90s and on that it, it was like hemorrhaging. And that's what the dancers I spoke to kind of felt being on the ground and just felt like they were constantly getting a new slew of dancers from the school or what have you. And um, I think that it wasn't discussed. You know, those people 
ceased to exist and um, only maybe decades after the fact they they were acknowledged again so for instance alberto alonso famously or not maybe not famously but he he did leave cuba in the 90s and it was only recently that uh, you know he's kind of been discussed again uh, to any extent so silence is the is the response okay. and here's a related question from Ada Ortusa Young. Uh, did you interview artists and dancers in the diaspora and those who have defected? You mentioned Caridad Martinez among among others, right? Yes, um, I, I uh, Caridad was the, you know, I did uh, interview other dancers in the diaspora. I just cited Caridad because I did the most uh, interviews with her and she has been the most open, I would say, about her discontent and, um, you know, what, what happened to her basically. Um, I, I interviewed um, several dancers in the diaspora as well as several dancers on the island. I feel as though it was it was almost equal. Um, I, I interviewed maybe five dancers in Puerto Rico. Some of them kind of were after the era I study, so I didn't talk about them a ton in the book. Um, and I also cite other people that, for instance, Carlos Acosta, I read his memoirs and whatnot, um, and he didn't defect necessarily. He's still back and forth on the island, but I did get definitely get the perspective of people who stayed in Cuba and people who decided to leave. Um, question from Emily Wilcox, who uh, first congratulates you for your talk. And she says that uh, she arrived a little late, but uh, she's sorry if I missed, if, if she missed this. But anyway, I, I don't think you covered this, this question directly, which is, which international communities did you see the Cuban dance world most in conversation with, whether through tours, competitions, adaptations of works, translations of dance writings, or visiting teachers? And did this uh, connection change over time uh, uh, during the period of covering the book? Yeah, thanks, Emily, for being here. Emily Wilcox has written an amazing book on Chinese uh, dance uh, in, in, in communist China. Um, so I would say that uh, they are most in conversation with more the Soviet Union and Latin America, um, and also people in Europe, uh, depending. and. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, it does change over time. In the early 60s, there are more Soviet advisors that come. And even though Che was pro-Chinese uh, communism, uh, Fidel was more on the Soviet side. So his preference kind of prevailed and shaped what dancers were being invited. So I don't know of a ton I can't, I mean, the Chinese companies were performing Cuba, but there weren't necessarily Chinese advisors that were um, coming to, you know, collaborate or choreographers necessarily, surprisingly. Even though I've talked to many dancers who said that Chinese companies really profoundly impacted them in terms of their aesthetics when they came and performed in Cuba. But Latin America is also a really important uh, co constant interlocutor. As I already mentioned, like Mexican dancers came, uh, Chilean dancers, Uruguayan dancers, um, et cetera. And Cuba is going to Brazil and Argentina and Guyana. So the Caribbean, the Caribbean is also a huge uh, point of exchange for the folkloric dance company. Um, so I think it's really important to, and, and that just increases over time. Whereas the Soviet, like after the sixties, there's not a ton of um, active exchange. I mean, there's some, I, Cuban dancers performed in the Soviet Union all the time, but there's not necessarily as vibrant or dynamic of exchange, I think, as with Latin American countries. Great. Here's an intriguing question from Prene Costales. Did you research a cross linkage with the official sports talent recruitment mm -hmm. process, particularly for young, among young men to masculinize ballet and fulfill the need for strong athletic male dancers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in some ways that definitely came up. And what I'll say, like I haven't researched anything related to sports per se. And at first I thought you were asking about that. And I think that there's a lot that could be done out of like, what did the sport, the healthy sporty, sporty body mean for revolutionary Cuba? But um, interestingly, when uh, male boys or little boys were auditioned they were they were told and their families were often told oh you're going to be doing fencing or you know basket or 
soccer, or baseball, or what have you. Um, not they wouldn't necessarily mention ballet, and then it would it would turn to it would end up being ballet. Modern and folkloric dance didn't have those kind of challenges, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, they were considered to be more more able to accommodate. Um, accommodate traditional masculinity. Um, but in any case, not only were dancers kind of lured into ballet specifically by being told, oh yeah, this is like actually sports kind of, sort of, not really, <laughs> but also um, in as kind of their program of training, there was, there was, you know, moments where they would take physical uh, education kind of classes and gymnastics and other things that would um, lend themselves to, um, you know, supporting their technical training, even though it wasn't strictly a technical class, a, a dance technique class. I don't know if that fully answered your question, but I do think sports uh, is is really important and fascinating. I just was, I, I'm completely ignorant about that. Okay, question from Melissa Valenzuela. Did Fidel Castro hold any suspicion toward dancers like Alicia Alonso who had joined American dance companies during their career? Um, I think that uh, certainly, um, he, he. I think there was always a good relationship between Alicia specifically and Castro. Um, just the fact that she she came back, she was actually in Chicago when when Castro Hour, and she came back and was a very vocal supporter from the beginning, um, as was her husband um, and people, many people around her, not everyone. Um, but I don't think there was a, ever any tensions there. I think that the government, I can't speak of Castro specifically, but cultural bureaucrats were definitely suspicious of um, always male dancers, always. Um, there was always a suspicion that professional male dancers, especially of modern dance and ballet, ballet especially, a little bit modern dance, not so much folkloric dance, but like other intellectuals, they they were they had the original sin, according to Che Guevara in one of um, in Man and Socialism. So uh, there's this tension with male dancers, especially. Okay. Here's one final question because we're running out of time by Dr. Manuel Gutierrez. I'm not sure I understand it myself, but I'll just pose it to you anyway. Would you make any connection between Alicia Alonso's departure from Cuba and the course of the genre in the island after 1959? Why do you think Ms. Alonso decided to stay in Spain and not in Cuba? I guess he's referring to before the revolution, no? Well, yeah, just, just to clarify, um, Alicia Alonso definitely was in Cuba uh, post 1959. Um, I think that um, perhaps, especially after the special period, which started the, the, the political and economic crisis in the 90s, um, conveniently, the ballet company would spend months at a time in Spain, and she definitely had like a second household. Um, but she was always kind of back and forth, hence why I did interview her in Havana in her, you know, office at the studio. Um, and saw her, you know, sometimes she would appear at a performance um, and get a kind of standing ovation from her box seat. So I definitely saw her plenty in Havana. Um, but I think that in the 90s, after the political and economic crisis, and mostly the economic aspect, it just became more comfortable to, to spend, say, three months doing a, a residency or a, a tour uh, in Spain. But technically speaking, she never really migrated, right? She, never, she never. She's been back and forth. Yeah. Okay, so we, we've reached our, our time limit. Uh, so thank you, Elizabeth, for your wonderful discussion. And thank you to the audience for your questions. Remember, you can order a copy of Elizabeth Schwal's Dancing with the Revolution by clicking on the call to action button on your screen. And again, thank you all for participating in this virtual book presentation. And we're now concluding tonight's event. Good evening.